Hello? Hello, Seattle. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Hello, world. Well, hello. Wholly independent and completely untethered since 2009, this is the Marty Reamer Show podcast. Reamer. Reamer. From their west side basement. West side. Lodged between the mold and the bad memories. Marty's story is like many of the others. It started with marijuana cigarettes. Here are your hosts, Jody Brothers and Marty Reamer. Marty Reamer. Hello, podcast. Podcast. From the basement on a Friday. A little sunshine shining in through the windows. And despite that, despite the... The bright outlook outside. I feel like today could be a bleak day for me. I uh, came down with a, well, the whole family came down with a nasty cold yesterday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nasty cold. And um, and going to bed last night, I'm trying to explore some more old school remedies for treating colds <laughs> rather than all this. Look, if I'm sharing chemicals with the meth lab down the street mm. for treating my cold, it's a bad chemical. It's not a chemical I want to be using. So no. so I uh, actually, because I didn't want to stay up all night coughing, I actually applied Vicks VapoRub to my chest. So if I smell like an old no, uh, man's medicine cabinet today, it's because... I didn't I want to say anything. I myself, well, you're very polite that way, oh. Michael. I, uh, it is, uh, I don't understand how that's supposed to work. And the only reason I even have Vicks VapoRub in the house is about a year ago when I got sick with a cold... And I was still working in the, at the radio station. Oh, those were sweet days. <laughs> uh, paycheck every couple mm. of weeks. And I uh, mentioned on the air, I just went on and on about how I'm sick, help me. Uh, people uh, said that this is the solution, the homespun old school solution. No, and not on your chest. I see you rubbing your chest. Yeah. Either that or it's just... Your way of <laughs> no, saying I, was, like, I was doing the pantomime for me <laughs> fixed, yeah. <laughs> Please keep pantomiming to a minimum on this show, all right? It's kind of a policy <laughs> I, they told me what you should do is apply Vicks VapoRub to the soles of your feet in liberal quantities, then pull socks on, then go to bed. You won't cough at all. And I had numerous people tell me that, and it didn't work worth a shit. Oh, my. <laughs> so last night I went with the old school approach, like you said. I rubbed it on my chest okay. then put a, a shirt on. And... But before I uh, finished the application, I made the mistake of looking at the ingredients. I said, what is Vicks yeah. VapoRub? And why does it give you this uh, sensation that you've become an yeah. old man? Uh-huh. There's turpentine in Vicks VapoRub. <laughs> <laughs> it's turpentine. That's ridiculous. So, a little bit of glue, some heat. I mean, that's ridiculous. It is, it's got a tar consistency. Okay. Like, it's really thick and sticky. Gross. And, uh, and then it has turpentine so that it... <laughs> oozes out so that I breathe it. And I have to admit, I didn't cough much last night. Wow. So there's my... Uh, and then this morning, <laughs> I come down the stairs carrying my daughter in my arms, precious cargo, Aww. and my socks, which probably still have Vicks Vapor <laughs> Rub from a year ago on them, <laughs> slipped out from underneath me. And being the old man that I am, I went tumbling down the stairs with my daughter. It's I came this close to really, like the signature... Uh, uh, sign that I've, I'm aged. I came this close to breaking my hip. So. <laughs> and Josie's no more. We're sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, she was a she was a nice cushion for me. Great. Yeah. Otherwise, She's, I would have had Josie's a Josie's fine. Hip. If anybody's worried, no, I, I, uh, I threw myself down, so I took the hit. Way to go. And uh, so now a nasty Charlie horse in my leg. Yeah. Uh, what I was actually trying to do on the staircase was recreate a climb that Ed Veesters did back in uh, 1988. Mm -hmm. I was trying to recreate that climb, and even up my stairs, I couldn't accomplish it the way. Right. No uh, way. studly Ed Veesters could. Did you have crampons? I did. <laughs> no, had I had crampons, I would have saved myself. <laughs> if you had crampons, you'd have taken something different than Vicks Vapor Rub. <laughs> no different thing. Um, we uh, have promised you. Okay, two things we're expecting today, and uh, and one I think is going to happen. The other one we're not so sure about. We invited Jody Brothers. Remember Jody? Oh, my gosh. We had good times with Jody. We invited Jody to come onto the podcast for the first time since giving birth and bring the little one with her. Totally. Apparently, she doesn't give a rip about this Hello, program. Judy. But I'll tell you who does. Uh, let's uh, link up here. This is exciting. Uh, we're going to go live. Skype is happening. Where's... Uh... We're not happening. Oh, no. I would like to fill this dead space with my own Vix experience. 
Vapor Rub. I put it somewhere else, Marty. Really? <laughs> no, that, I never uh, used it. That's disgusting. Why is that not full screen? Let's get that full screen. <laughs> We're calling. This okay. Is exciting. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it was funky. Oh. Wait, hello. hold on. Uh, hello, Ed Veesters, please. Here we are. <laughs> hey, Ed. Well, we don't have a uh, video quite yet, but we do have. Uh, can you. S oh, Yaz yeah, is really cornhole this whole thing. We hear him, though. Are you there, Ed? Yeah, do you see me? Not yet. <laughs> but we hear you, and that is exciting. I can see you, you. You can see oh. us? Yeah. Ser seriously. Yeah, it's just completely cornholed this thing. <laughs> oh, wait a sec. There we are. Oh. And uh, now, this is exciting. Ed, uh, happy holidays to you, sir. Thanks. Same to you. Where are you? Where, where, where are we uh, we're catching you? Uh, probably atop some desolate mountain peak. K2? Hang on. <laughs> no, I'm here. Are you GPSing yourself to find out where yeah. you are? Yeah, no, I'm actually here in um, Bainbridge Island. Oh right my now. God! How do you survive in those conditions? <laughs> well, I have the house temperature turned down. <laughs> I, I've often wondered about that. Seriously, yeah, you got to yeah. fix this. Um, I've often wondered about that. When you come back from trekking the the Himalayas, and and you come home. Do you do you tell your wife, gosh, why do you have the heat up to sixty degrees? This is unbearable. <laughs> yeah, we we always have a battle with the thermostat. She likes it warm, and I'm always turning it off. Yeah, I think that's a male female thing. Totally, I have the same. I it might be just that I'm cheap. <laughs> it's weird because this worked earlier when I you could see me. I think right. Yeah can can you not see, can you see yourself like in the corner of your uh, little. No, I can't. Yeah, that might be the problem. Uh, that might be the. But you, oh wait, there we go. Uh, now you're coming on. Something's happening. There we go. We uh, we better? appreciate. Oh, oh, there he is. There's the guy, the stud. Hi, Ed. Now we got you. Hey. <laughs> are you? Uh, so is that? Uh, where where are you right now? Are you d down in the basement? No, I'm. In my house it's my kids uh desk area right here <laughs> are they the only ones that have access to a computer <laughs> no i've got my own but this is theirs and this is the only one that has a camera on it mine's oh, older i see um yeah. at, at first when i asked you uh, said that we wanted to skype with you you said well let me see if i can work that out i would think skype was made for mountain climbers well not really i mean uh you know, the only people I would call is the friends that I have in Europe. But it's it's so it's easier just to pick up the phone. Well, you know, no, seriously, I'm, I'm talking about look at anybody. I'm talking about when you're actually out on a you know out on a trek. I would think Skype is an awesome way to stay in touch with the folks back home. Well, easier than that, it would be a, a satellite phone because then I can just call from anywhere in the world. Uh, with the Skype, obviously, you need to have a computer with a camera and the whole deal, and that's just a lot of stuff. Yeah, I see. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to check in with you is we haven't talked to you in a while. Have you, have you done anything since uh, the last time we talked? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. I, uh, your <laughs> life is, is uh, starting to mimic mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get out of the house. <laughs> But uh, that'll all change after the first of the year. You're um, you're destined to uh, head to Antarctica of all places. Yeah, I'm going to leave here on the first, and then we should be uh, flying hopefully to the ice on the fourth of January. I always like to hear the routing. What gets you to these uh, locations? Because that's not yeah, typical it's commercial a, travel. A long trip. It's like a multi-stop trip all the way down to the tip of South America, and that takes a full 24 hours. And then from there, it's a six-hour flight to the ice itself with this big, huge Soviet cargo plane. <laughs> <laughs> and is that a commercial uh, expedition? I mean, can you just book a flight, buy a ticket on a Russian cargo plane, or do you have to have connections? It's, it's, it's an adventure network company, and they charter this flight out for people that are flying to Antarctica. So it's very expensive, but they have only certain days 
of the month that they go. So you got to be there ready to go and you have to book at least a year in advance. Wow. And then what is the, uh, once you land on the ice, what is the purpose of being in Antarctica? I imagine there's a climb involved. Yeah, we're going to climb uh, the highest peak in Vincent, uh, in Antarctica called Vincent Massive. It's 16,000 foot mountain. And how close to the drop-off point is it? Or is there a fair amount of trekking just to get to the mountain? Well, they drop us with the big cargo jet, and then from there we fly with a smaller uh, plane that on skis, and then that lands us basically at the foot of the mountains. And then from there it's about a 10-day uh, climb or whatever, depending on weather. But we're pretty much right at the bottom of the mountain when they drop us off. And uh, if I remember my geology at all, it is uh, summer down there, so it's a little like spring break in Cancun in Antarctica right now? Right, yeah, I got my, my shorts packed and my surfboard, and it's actually, just, you know, it's summer, uh, but it'll, it'll only be, you know, 20 below instead of 80 below. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, and uh, and what, inspi- what made you think this is where I have to go next? Well, I've always wanted to go there, uh, and so the opportunity finally arose that we, we're there's four of us guiding. We have four clients we're taking. Uh, it's partially supported through First Descent and Eddie Bauer, uh, and the whole idea is that we're going to be down there getting video footage, taking photos of all the gear and products that we have designed and developed. So it's kind of a multi-purpose uh, trip. Hmm. Ed, Michael Stusser here. Hello. Uh, um, I'm wondering, when you have a climb, it, it sounds colder to me than maybe other climbs. Is there any factor in that? If you're going to be, you know, in India, it's is it warmer when you're at the top? Is it super cold in Antarctica? It's super cold. <laughs> it's way colder there than probably any of the climbs I've done even on Everest. I mean, consistently cold. Yeah. Uh, on, on Everest, the, the last day was probably the coldest, but in Antarctica, it's gonna be like being on the summit of Everest every day or colder. And what do you, are you like most people who just don't like to be cold? No, I love to be cold. <laughs> I, I do a lot better uh, in the cold than I do in, in, in the warmth. And so we'll be fully outfitted we've got big old fat down parkas and down pants and big huge boots and big huge mittens uh and so you won't get you won't get hot believe it or not but you'll stay comfortable so what are the challenges that are unique to to trekking and climbing in antarctica versus say the himalayas or wherever else you've you've been well two things one is it's so remote i mean they basically drop you off with a plane and then when you're done, you've got to wait for them to get you. There's no other way out of there. And then the, the second one is just the, the cold, the consistent cold. And if it's windy, uh, you've got to be hunkered down in your tent. I mean, you can't even be outside because the cold added with the wind chill uh, can be severe. So you really have to be thoughtful and protect yourself all the time when you're outside. How, um, how big of a group is going? Well, we have four guides and we have four clients, so that's eight of us, and then we'll have a videographer uh, and a cameraman, so ten total. Ten total. And is do you set up base camp the way you would ordinarily do at Everest? Yeah, we'll set up a base, and then from there we'll, we'll operate out of there. So we'll have all of our gear and all of our food and our supplies at that base. Uh, there won't be a lot of stuff because we only plan to be there maybe a couple of weeks. And then from there, we start carrying and moving our equipment up the mountain, kind of going up and down and up and down to acclimatize along the way. Uh, but from base, there's only two or three camps. So it's not a huge undertaking. And what kind of gear do you have besides the climbing gear? I mean, do you have generators and do you, or do you go sans power the entire excursion? Yeah, we're going to go completely solar. I mean, uh, I've already got a setup to, to charge my, my sat phone, my camera batteries, my iPod and all that. And even the camera guys, they've got these really cool tricked out solar systems. I mean, when you're an, in Antarctica, you kind of want to be clean and, and, and leave no trace. And, and solar is totally the way to go these days. <laughs> Do you, for your iPod, is that for just listening to tunes as you're climbing? Whoops. Yeah, you know, when you're, the iPod is basically when you have downtime. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to be in your tent a lot 
in a storm. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, before you go to sleep, you want some sort of entertainment. So it's either going to be music or, or reading. And I, I tend to bring a lot of books with me. I, I've contemplated bringing a Kindle, uh, but I don't know how it's going to operate in the cold. And in fact, yesterday I put it in the freezer for about eight <laughs> hours just to see how it worked. And it didn't work. It didn't work when I pulled it out. It did not work? <laughs> it did not work. Oh, oh I'm not that surprised. Is a- <laughs> there it goes. Once I warmed it up, I warmed it up and it worked again. But I, oh. I, I don't know if it's going to stay warm enough down there for for it to work at all. I don't know. And that would have been an, an, an incredible endorsement opportunity mm. for you, Ed. <laughs> I know. I was really working on it. So uh-huh. <laughs> I, I got a way to you know keep it in my pants or something to keep it warm. Uh, apparently, another endorsement opportunity <laughs> there. Uh, <laughs> when you're in Ed Veaster's pants, you stay warm. I'm Ed Veaster. Uh So uh, let's get down to the, the is it is it difficult to do human business when you're up there? Like, uh, uh, you know, have bowel movements when it's that. Sorry to be so vulgar, but I, I mean, these are the questions. questions when you're flying into space. You want to know when you're in yep. Antarctica. Uh, is it just dig a hole in the snow? There's no way I would just go three weeks without. Yeah, you know what? It's it's you know when you go there again. It's uh, especially in Antarctica. We have this adage of leave no trace. Whatever we take with us, we have to bring back. This and is sounding gross. Everything. Mm. And so we have means and, and methods to collect our human business, as you might call it. <laughs> and obviously, it, it freezes in a heartbeat anyway. So then you just pick up the nuggets and then you haul them back out of there. Oh, it's just like uh, this is like going on a walk with your dog. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. deal. Your dog was a nice. And it's dude. a great, it's a great thing to do. You know, we're down there visiting. We don't want to leave a bunch of trash and garbage. So yeah. we want to leave it as 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 pristine as when we got there. Do you see any signs of previous expeditions when you land there? Is like well, is this Shackleton ship still uh, lodged in an iceberg somewhere down there? No, his ship sank, as you remember the book. Oh, that's uh, right. It got crushed and then sank. Yeah. yeah. No, there. you know, whatever's there typically blows away, and hopefully we won't see any other uh, signs of garbage or anything. There will be some other people there climbing, so we'll see tents and that type of thing. Uh, but the last thing you want to see is remnants that somebody, you know, left behind. Yeah, well, I can understand that. That's And props to you for, for keeping it pristine. For keeping it do, pristine. Do, you, do you ever get lonely or is it the other side of the equation that people around you start to bug you after a while civilization starts to bug you you know it is kind of cool to really step away and and when you go on these climbs you know every day that all you have to do is get up get dressed eat your breakfast and start hauling a load up the mountain i mean it's so simple so basic uh you got to take care of yourself and obviously you try to be selective about the people that you're with because you know i've always said if you don't like them at at sea level you're not going to like them (laughs) at fourteen thousand feet right Uh, and believe it or not a lot of human conflict destroys a lot of expeditions so you have to be really careful and and when you're on one of these trips you're with your friends and then obviously with a satellite phone or whatever you do have the connection with with friends and family back home Uh and have there been times where you've met somebody at sea level and you've said i don't think i'm climbing with that guy he he's an ass Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, there's people all the time that you go, you know, there's no way I could go on an expedition with them. Um, Obviously, if we have sometimes we have clients that we take on trips and we don't meet them until the day of the climb. And then you just kind of got to deal with it. Mm. Uh, But the people that are coming with us, I mean, we've screened them. We know them. Hopefully, you know, they'll be fun to hang out with. And if not, we'll just put them in a tent, you know, (laughs) a, a great distance away from us. (laughs) <laughs> that uh, debacle up on Everest that uh, Krakauer put, uh, you know, wrote about in his book was was at the core of that. Was it personality conflicts? No, not really. I think it was just a lot of uh, things, little things that went wrong on that final day. People maybe pressuring the guides to continue, and and I think also the guides that were leading those trips. They they had obviously business based decisions that they were thinking about as they were taking their clients up to the top. 
uh, and whenever you're guiding people in the mountains, you should, you know, the, the, the fact that they're paying a lot of money to be there should yeah, yeah. be completely irrelevant. Really? Yeah, but it can't, and, and it can't be. you're just there to climb a mountain, get them up and get them down, yeah. primarily to get them home. So you leave January 1st to, uh, on your expedition, and then when do you return again? Uh, probably around the 23rd of January. That's our, our, our date. Uh-huh. And, uh, and you've never climbed this mountain before? No, never been down there. Uh, oh, you've never again, been never to Antarctica. Never been down there. It's, it's, it's a long way to go. It's very expensive. And to organize one of these trips, you know, takes a lot of work. But things fell into place. And so, you know, I get to go. I really want to go. I'd be really excited. Is, uh, is there wildlife you're going to run into? No, because, you know, all the wildlife in Antarctica is on the coast. Uh, and once you're in the interior, you know, there's there's no food there for anything. <laughs> so we'll see absolutely no uh, signs of wildlife down there. Huh. Wow. And how technical is the climb? Uh, it's relatively non-technical. I mean, we'll be on glaciers and there's crevasses, so we'll have to be roped together we'll have crampons and ice axes uh but there's no real severe technical uh climbing it's just a big high cold glaciated mountain and when you arrive at the summit what do you expect to experience there uh, as related to uh everest say well i mean it's another mountain and when you get to the top of whatever mountain that you've prepared to go to and planned on climbing and worked so hard for it's always you know very rewarding and i've heard that the view from the summit of uh, vincent is quite spectacular i mean you're looking out on a sea of ice and and then through that sea of ice are all these little mountain peaks that are kind of poking poking right out of the, the flat ice so it should be quite spectacular and how close to the actual south pole are you Oh, hundreds of miles. Yeah, we're much closer to the coast, and I think uh, we're about five or six hundred miles uh, from the, the South Pole itself. Huh. When when you're at the bottom and you guys are starting up, have you just map quested the way up? Is that the way you guys get there? You just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, when you get there, there's a little red line <laughs> in the snow, and you kind of follow the red line. Uh -huh. no, are there are there actually like you know dozens of routes, or do you have one picked already? Yeah, there's there's a few routes on the mountain, but we're gonna probably climb what's called the the, the standard route or the route that most guided parties climb. Uh, it's the easiest, it's the safest, uh, and when you're guiding people, that's that's kind of the, the typical way that you want to go. And it's a known entity versus something that you're you're trying to figure out along the way. Yep. Do you have any fun on the trip? Do you just like sometimes? Uh just sled down one part of the hill, <laughs> anything like that, any crazy hijinks? We do. I mean, uh, like I said, uh, there's going to be some days when we can't be climbing because of weather or wind, and and we've already got plans to set up a bowling alley on the ice. <laughs> uh, you know, you make, you, you make the pins out of icicles, and then you get a big snowball, and you, you start bowling, and then if there's a, a, a another expedition in the neighborhood, you, you – you bring them on over and you have a competition, you know, so there's various ways to stay entertained down there. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, and what role I know you of course don't need any oxygen. You breathe through gills on the side of your <laughs> neck if you want to show the people, but, uh, or you just keep those secret. Um, but is, is it a high enough peak where you would, you would even contemplate using oxygen for the clients say? No, you know, 16,000 feet there, there's no need to, bring supplemental oxygen. Uh, most of the people that do higher climbs don't use oxygen until about 24,000 feet. So we're well below that. Uh, but we still have to take the time to acclimatize, uh, to adjust to the altitude. We can't go from sea level to 16,000 feet. Um, but we'll be there long enough to slowly adjust to that altitude. Wow. We, uh, as always, we wish you well. I don't know why you do this, Ed, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, just keep doing it and stay healthy. That's uh, that's our number one concern. Thanks, thanks. And I mean, if, if you guys are interested, we will be doing daily uh, dispatches, audio, and we'll send a photo. Uh, so folks can go to my website if they want to log on every day and see you know see what we're doing. Oh, and we will definitely do that because we did that when you went on that uh, 
uh, on the Everest trek, uh, where, by the way, I still have the rock. I, good, I, I good. know I know when I got uh, fired at the mountain, that was your number one concern. <laughs> Who cares about your future and your family? Did you save the rock? Because uh, he, he did. Ed was cool enough to bring back an actual chunk of the top of uh, Everest. Wow. It's a little bit lower now, uh, <laughs> thanks to a, a little piece of the mountain that I have. <laughs> well, I'll see if I can get you one from uh, the top of Vincent. Yeah, and don't confuse it with what comes back in that little baggie <laughs> of frozen nuggets. Mm. Here, Marty, here's a nice, <laughs> a nice little something, something. Uh, anyhow, thanks for taking the time with us. Uh, do, do stay well, and, uh, and we'll talk to you soon, Ed. All right, thanks a lot. All right. and by the way, wait, wait, before we let you go, and I'm sorry that the video uh, thing didn't work out on the webcast, but you have a map. Your son has a map behind you uh, on the wall. What is that a map of? Or is that a oh, map? That's a- that's a map of uh, Bainbridge Island. Okay. <laughs> so, uh-huh. Which route do you usually? Lost. Which route do you yeah. usually take to get home? Is it the yeah. standard route or the more technical one? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, Shut right. up, Marty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, all right. Thank you very much, Ed. All the best to you. Okay. Happy holidays. Say hi to the family. Okay. Great. See ya. All right. Ciao. All right. There's Ed Beaster. <laughs> That's great. And, I, by the way, have summited uh, Bainbridge. Uh, yeah. Well. I have. That's something. Yes, that is something. That guy's amazing. I mean, I mean, I I agree with you. I don't know why somebody keeps doing it, uh-huh. but he obviously. I mean, if I'm going with somebody, I'm going with that guy. <laughs> oh my! Well, you know, did you ever read Krakauer's yeah, book? Yeah, I did. I did because he's I- a hero. If, if someone has a crush on Ed Veesters, it's John Krakauer. Yeah, because the perspective in that book is that that you know all hell is breaking loose the russian is a jackass the mm-hmm. the socialite from new york is causing a bunch of problems and then dun, dun, da, da, mm-hmm. uh, who swoops in to save the day ed veesters at, yep. at the you know risking his own repeated uh, imax expedition to that and his life numerous times yeah to save uh, who they were able to save yeah <laughs> on that ill-fated journey to the top of everest so uh, yes, thanks to Ed Veesters for uh, taking a little time. I don't know. I'm I'm I, I, I the second I knew that the Russian cargo plane was dropping me off uh-huh. and I wouldn't see them <laughs> again for a while, I'd start to have pain like in my uh, oh. appendix region. Going, what, what, what's I that? forgot I have to do something at home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no way, Did I? no way. But that's why I mean he really is a different kind of creature because well, I asked about the cold. I love the cold. What 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 is wrong with you? Yeah. Well, I like the cold too. I like. I would prefer to be cool. Yeah. Rather than hot. Okay, but we're talking about. You know, I, know, I know. Can't take the goggles off. Your eyeballs freeze. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, it's nasty. So he's tough. There was an, uh, a part of the Krakauer book, and one particular district, descriptive phrase where they were talking about the guy who ended up losing both hands or all the mm-hmm. fingers on mm-hmm. both hands. Yeah, the guy from Texas. Yep. Gosh, I remember what he's it, alive. Hall or whatever. And uh, and they talked about how he thought, you know, it's over, and he's laying up there on the mountain, frozen cold, and his hands clinked together like champagne glasses. Okay. And that, just that ah. phrase, ah. immediately causes so much pain oh to my, my extremities. Yeah. That his Exciting. hands clinked together like champagne glasses. And shattered, apparently, like champagne glasses. That's true. All they those did, fingers. Did shatter. That's nasty. Uh <laughs> So, uh, and uh, I don't think there's a, a point in keeping the show going. I think we oh, well. <laughs> shut the show down now. Uh, wow. Um, Jody, can Jody. you believe that? Seriously. Let's, let's, can we badmouth Jody's baby just because she didn't show up here? Well, I don't know if we have to take it out on the baby. All right. The baby seems so innocent. In I haven't met this. the baby. Although she did say she would show up as long as the baby cooperated. So, really, if you cut to the core of the mm-hmm. matter, it is the baby yeah. that's causing the problems. Yeah. Very uncooperative baby. Uh, um, what else did I have here? I had some other interesting things to talk about. I don't know. You you can decide for yourself. If, if they're interesting. interesting. Uh, you know, <laughs> Dan and Yogurt, how Dan and made these outrageous claims, thanks to the help of Jamie Lee Curtis, that e- eating Activia, like if that didn't yeah. improve and regulate your system within two weeks, you could get your money back. Okay. It's one of the few advertising claims that I bought into. I uh-huh. said, wow, that is going out there on a limb mm. to just go on television and say this is a cure-all for any sort of intestinal disorders. Uh, it turns out they had no right to say that and they are paying a $21 million settlement to the Federal Trade Commission. 
what about all those people who ingested this nasty crap? Well, it's not nasty. It's yogurt. Oh, right. But something went wrong. No, nothing went wrong. It's the, the wrong was the claim. Oh, OK. Uh, wasn't bad yogurt. It just wasn't effective yogurt. The Federal Trade Commission had been looking into uh, and determining whether Dannon was seriously exaggerating what the probiotic bacteria in Activia could do. Under both state and federal law, products can only advertise themselves as health cures if they're actual drugs. Don't want to take that that uh, opportunity away from the pharmaceutical companies. No, no. Unless you're an actual drug, you can do no good. Yeah. Uh, you can't advertise a f- food as a cure. Uh, the FTC also couldn't find legitimate scientific research or proof of Dannon's claims. So they sued Dannon. And then Dannon settled out of court, paying $21 million to 39 states. That's a lot of dough. They're also banned from claiming that any yogurt or any other product can keep you from getting sick, cure digestive problems, or give you any, any other health benefits. Vicks Vaporub, however. Vicks is a drug. Uh, you got to put it on the soles of your feet, though, um, from what I understand. For it to be effective. <laughs> and then walk down a staircase. With a child and, ah! in your arms. Oh, I mean, that's God, it was so ridiculous. bad. I seriously... My, the, I, I should just drop my pants right now and show you the can't we? Well, luckily, it's a podcast for most people, so nobody would see that. Oh, good Lord. Uh, something else <laughs> uh, I came across, speaking of, uh, of medicines uh, and claims, they uh, did an exhaustive study on aspirin and have now determined that aspirin reduces your risk of dying of cancer by 60%. 60% yeah, aspirin. Was... I've always thought aspirin is a wonder drug uh-huh. that gets so little press these days because the patent has expired so that no one is making buco bucks off of aspirin whereas they still are making it off of advil and ibuprofen tylenol. and tylenol yep. and all that when my wife gets a headache or any kind of an ache or a pain i always say to her take an aspirin mm-hmm. and she's like no i'm gonna take an ibuprofen i'm yeah. gonna take an advil and i'm like why you know i get that though because i don't like the little powdery tap aspirin's a powdery i like the coated gels and the caplets now Yes, you know what I, I mean. I, I, Just because you know smoother, but it has. You're right. Aspirin is it turns it, out. Oh my God, it, it reduces your chances of getting the, colon cancer. How it, often uh, though do I have to heart take heart. it? Well, I don't know. It was a little blurb in a magazine, and they did say once a day an aspirin a day. But I think they were trying to be clever, you know, like a do- uh, an apple a day. You okay. know, so they were doing an aspirin a day, and I don't know if that's the dosage that they were testing. But sixty yeah, percent lower chance. And, and it has so many other benefits. Less chance of dying of a heart attack. I mean, you might bleed out. You might oh, bleed out. Come on. <laughs> Get over it already. No, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, I, I <laughs> don't want cancer. I'm taking aspirin. I'm doing it. <laughs> Which they did in little caplets, though. I love it. And they're colored, blue and white on each side. It's really exciting. Sir, I, I, when you... So, seriously, when you get in... When was the last time that's you took what, an aspirin? Uh, yesterday, I had a hangover, took it. You took an actual aspirin? I, no, I did not take aspirin. I took a leave. Which is not again. Mm-hmm. It drives me crazy. Yeah, of course. No, you're right. It's probably a German thing that you've got like the giant things and they're sort of <laughs> well, industrial looking. Yeah, Bayer. <laughs> Bayer, uh, yeah. Bayer, I think uh, originally had the uh, the patent for aspirin, and they're a German company. Yes. And they also, I think, originally had the patent of cocaine. Same thing. And um, people are still taking cocaine on a regular basis. They are, and none of them are getting cancer because they're dying <laughs> yeah, way they before that. that. Uh, yeah, it's it's all... That's good. When aspirin was the last time you actually took an aspirin? Not, it's forever, Marty. I don't have any in the house. I've got all these wonderfully coated caplets. And they go down really smooth. They're not all the powdery. Aspirin has the powdery problem. Yeah. On your tongue and all that. I'm, I'm really curious. If you're listening, and I'm, I'd be curious to find out why people don't take aspirin. I mean, that's a, a good legitimate reason. My wife doesn't claim that. She claims she takes all this other stuff because it works better. Yeah, that's and that's not true, I'm sure. And the only argument I think that is legit is that aspirin is a little hard on your stomach. But I think there's a way around. I mean, I take bufferin. So it's buffered so that it, <laughs> buffered. it, it lands there in like a ball of it's, cotton or something. Right, right. And then... Um, <laughs> exactly. So I immediately popped an aspirin yesterday. That, along with my... Vicks Ugh. Vapo Rub. Right, right. <laughs> I was just like literally, I was living in 19th century. <laughs> that's weird. Uh, yeah. And he put leeches on himself. But we, we're going to talk about that too. We'll have to go back that far. <laughs> but he feels great today. All right. Well, so there's my push for aspirin. Wow. It's cheap. It's a wonder drug. And it's uh, 60% less chance of uh, dying. Yeah, I'm taking some. Totally taking some. 
I wonder if I wonder if Ed Beasters will pack a little aspirin along in his I think so. in his satchel. No, he's gonna take some designer drug. Right. Right. Chaplets. I was thinking more e- ecstasy. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be on ecstasy. <laughs> it's gonna be <laughs> tripping <Nice>. out <laughs> on top of the mountain. Thanks to Ed Veesters for joining us yeah. today. No thanks to Jody <laughs> or to Yaz, who completely screwed up our whole Skype experience. Mm-hmm. We might as well just have called him. He's over on Bainbridge. We can call him on the phone. But no, good. we were using Skype so we could get a little video interaction. Yeah. Well, we did get to see him, and he looked good. He does. He does. And go to his website while he's up there. Yeah. The month we'll, of January. We'll follow his trek to the tallest peak on Antarctica throughout the month of January. Thank you, Michael, for filling in. Drew Dundon will be filling in next week in Jody's stead. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. Holy independent since 2009, this has been the Marty Reamer Show podcast. For more information about topics discussed, visit our website, martyreamer.com. That's Marty, R-I-E-M-E-R dot com. Thank you for subscribing to the podcast. Tell your friends. They look nice. Oh, and to subscribe to our podcast, that too. The Marty Reamer Show is a production of Twisted Scholar Incorporated. Remember, in America, a corporation is a person too. I'm your Devil May Care announcer, Blair Schultz. See you next time. Word out. Goodbye, Marty. Goodbye, Jody.